Welcome to Understanding Epidemics, a many model approach. Hi, my name is Scott Page, and I'm a professor at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. In this video, we're going to very briefly talk about why we model and describe four classes of models for epidemics, and then focus most of our time on the first of those models, which is called a fatality rate model. So why do we model? In my book, The Model Thinker, I give seven categories of reasons to model. The first is to reason. Within a model, we can think logically, so models help us reason better. Second, models help us explain. We can explain the amount of force produced with a simple equation, force equals mass times acceleration. Third, models help us design. So like architects construct models, policymakers construct models in order to design things. Fourth, Models help us communicate. The world is an incredibly complex place. Models are simpler, and so we can communicate how things work in the world much more effectively if we're using a model. Fifth, and this is gonna be most important in the case of epidemic, models help us act. Models help us decide what action to take, and one way that they do that is models make predictions. So if we're thinking about taking one action, a model can often tell us what the likely outcomes or the possible outcomes will be of that action. And then last, models are a place where we can just kind of explore ideas and think about alternative realities, alternative possibilities, separate from the real world. Okay, so let's start out by talking about the kinds of models we might use to understand a pandemic or an epidemic. So the first will be expected fatality models, and that's what I'm gonna cover in this video. There's also curve-fitting models, mathematical models, something called an SIR model. So these are done with mathematical equations, and then agent-based models. Think of these as computer models. In this lecture, we're going to cover the first of these four types of models, expected fatality models. Now, these models are really simple. What they do is they write the number of fatalities in an equation form. It's equal to the population times the percentage infected times the fatality rate. So the data that we have so far suggests that the fatality rate for COVID-19 is between a half a percent and 2.5%. So how would we take that data and put it in the model? So we've got this equation, the number of fatalities equals the population times the percentage infected times the fatality rate. Well, now we know the fatality rate is somewhere between a half a percent and two and a half percent. So maybe we say 1%. And we know the population in the United States, it's approximately 330 million people. If the situation plays out such that the fatality rate is 1% and only 3% of people get infected, we have only 100,000 fatalities. If though 30% of people get infected and the fatality rate is 2.5%, we end up with 2.5 million fatalities. That's a huge difference. So when we look at this model, there's three terms, the population, the percentage infected, and the fatality rate. The population we know, that's a fact. It's roughly 330 million. The percentage infected, and the fatality rate, these are things we have to predict. And this is where models end up being really useful. Now, if we don't predict, we're gonna learn from data. We're just gonna find out what happened and we'll find out that either 100,000 people died or two and a half million people died. So this is why models become so important because if we can predict with accuracy, we can hopefully take actions to reduce that number. So again, the fatality rate, when you look at the data, is between a half a percent and three percent, but that's in aggregate. If we look at the data on fatality rates from China, we see huge differences by age. And if we look at early data from the United States, we see a similar pattern. What this means is we wanna take our model and we wanna construct more categories. So instead of just having everyone in one big box, we wanna break people into categories by age. Now these categories differ by size. So there's many fewer people older than 80 than there are in the 20 to 30 age group. So we have to take that into account. So now, if we look at any one of those age groups, let's say the people between age 10 and 20, and look at the number of fatalities times the population times the percentage affected times the fatality rate, we have that there's 40 million people between the ages of 10 and 20. There's gonna be some percentage infected, and there's a fatality rate of only 0.2%. So if we slide that number over and then multiply, we see the number of fatalities is gonna be 80,000 times the percentage infected for this age group. Now, if we compare this to the group of people who are age 70 to 80, there, we see there's 25 million people. The fatality rate, let's say, is 8%. So again, slide the numbers over, multiply through, and we get the number of fatalities for this age group is going to be 2 million times the percentage infected. So we suddenly see that this population is much more vulnerable. 
To do the full calculation, what we've got to do is we've got to, for each box, each age category, count the number of people, and then the fatality rate, and multiply those together. Again, this is assuming the percentage infected is the same across all age groups. I'll come back to that. So if we do that calculation, we assume 10% infected, we have 650,000 deaths. If we assume 2% infected, we would have 130,000 deaths. Now let's think about how we can use this model to act. Let's look at the population categorized by age again. We see that the fatality rate is really high for people 60 and up, and pretty low for people less than that. So what we'd like to do is reduce the infection rate for people in that upper age group. How do we do that? Quarantine. We have better self-behavior, so people in that older age group make sure that they don't get out much. We also have better community behavior, so people who interact with older people keep their social distance or only meet with them virtually. So suppose we do that. Suppose we could somehow quarantine the elderly 80% of them. So instead of having 10% of the people less than 60 and 10% of the people older than 60 being infected with the disease, we lower the number of people infected with the disease among that older age group to 2%. That would drop the number of fatalities from 650,000 down to 210,000. So this idea of breaking people up by age was a really good idea, and it begs the question, why don't we create more categories? Why don't we also consider region, health, genetics? And if we do that, we can identify what the most vulnerable populations are and make sure we quarantine those people. This is a great idea, but there's a potential problem. And that problem comes in the form of something known as the bias-variance trade-off. Let me explain this very briefly. Suppose I have 100,000 cases and I see a fatality rate of 1%. What I could do, and we did this by age, is break it into 10 boxes. And then in each box, I might have 10,000 cases. This would be my data. Well, then I might break those boxes in addition to doing age, I might break it into 10 regions of the country. And now I've got 100 boxes. And each of those 100 boxes has 1,000 cases. Well, then I might break it into health status. I might have sort of 10 levels of how healthy someone is. And now I've got a thousand boxes, but I've only got a hundred cases per box. But in some of these boxes, I might be able to identify very, very vulnerable people. So there might be people who sort of live in one region of the country in a certain age group, have a certain health status, where I see a number like 34%. Here's where the bias variance trade-off comes in. When I've got a hundred thousand cases and I look at any one person, the, probably that box percentage is the same as that person's percentage of suffering a fatality is really, really low. It has high bias. That estimate, that 1% estimate, isn't right. However, because I've got lots of data, is the 1% estimate correct for the box? Absolutely, because I've got 100,000 data points. So I've got high bias. I'm probably not going to be right for that person, but low variance. The 1% estimate is correct. Suppose I go to the other extreme, I have 100 cases per box. Well, now, is the percentage for that box, and I've got people in groups of very small groups, is the percentage for that box probably the same as the percentage for that person? Absolutely right, because I've identified the person pretty tightly. However, I don't have that much data. I've only got 100 data points for that box. So is the percentage estimate correct for the box? Probably not. That's why we think of this as having high variance. So if we had enough data, the estimate would be correct. It's low bias, but we don't have much data. So what are the implications of this? The first is, if I have more categories, then I'm better at targeting whom to quarantine. So this is the fact of getting less bias. I can really figure out who we should quarantine, who we should protect. However, as I create more categories, because I'm going to basically have bad estimates for some of those boxes, I could quarantine the wrong people. But even worse, I could not be quarantining some people who should be quarantined. So there's a trade-off. So rather than just construct more and more categories and get these tiny, tiny boxes, what we can do is we can construct a variety of models, each creating different types of categories, some based on age, some based on region, some based on health, some based on genetics, some based on combinations of those two, and then looking across those models, trying to make robust predictions about who we should quarantine. Quick summary. In the fatality rate model, the number of fatalities depends on the number infected and the fatality rate. So those are the things we try and make sense of. Identifying categories by breaking people up into categories, what we can do is we can inform action. 
we can inform policy and make wiser choices. We need to use multiple models that use different categories to make robust predictions about how to make those actions. So we shouldn't rely just on a single model. But what we also see as we construct this model is the need for more models. Because the big remaining question here is, how do we predict how many people get infected? What is the percentage infected? Because when you do those calculations, there's a huge difference between 2% infected and 30% infected. So that's where we're going to go next. We'll start talking about some models that help us predict what the percentage infected will be and what actions we can take to reduce the percentage infected. Thank you.